done. Okay, well, um, yes, yeah, so we're going to talk about what we can know historically about Jesus, about the Messiah. And, you know, for some of us, perhaps we think about our relationship with God, and of course we believe that we have supernatural certainty because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and that's true, we, we can have that, although... I would say that most of us probably know the Holy Spirit's presence in our life isn't always as strong as it is in other times, right? Sometimes it seems like he's there, and other times it seems like he's kind of taking a vacation, right? Um, just because that's the way faith is. Sometimes God's presence in our lives is stronger than others. But of course, many people in other faiths have religious experiences. I don't know if you ever talked to Mormons, but they think their faith is true because the Holy Spirit confirms the Book of Mormon. If they someone is seeking, they read the Book of Mormon, they're supposed to experience the Holy Spirit. It's like a personal experience for them. So there, it sounds kind of similar sometimes to what Christians say, but that's what they believe. And there's other people that claim to have religious experiences as well. So you need some facts and some history behind your faith. You can't just rely on your personal experience with the Holy Spirit, at least not if you're going to engage the world around you. I don't know how much, you know, you're actually talking to people about what you believe or getting challenged, but um, you're definitely going to need more than simply you have the Holy Spirit and he's, you know, you experience him daily. That's, that's important, but it can't be the only thing you have or use when you're thinking about engaging the world. So, of course, with Jesus, there's been more than enough images of him, more than enough books written about him. Uh, more than enough books still being written about him and people have all kinds of ideas about him and more than enough debates about him magazine articles news stories so never ends and probably will continue on until he returns but um you know of course people there's more of the images than are on this screen of what people think he looked like but that's a whole other story but anyways so my suggestion, if you want to go deeper on this, let me give you some some readings. Um, I recommend this book. This is one of my favorite books. Uh, came out oh maybe fifteen years ago, but it's it's an excellent book. Um, anyway, I recommend this book right here. Uh, I recommend these books. You can look these up on Amazon when I send out. The PDF, you can look these up in deeper detail if you want, but these are all really good books if you want to go deeper on the topic. Um, right here, these are more books. Um, I really recommend, uh, well, they're all good books, but uh, I definitely recommend these two right here. Um, this one by Brant Pitry, it came out five or six years ago. I think this is one of the best books I've read in a while. Um, so that's a really good book. And then um, shorter book on Is Jesus History by John Dixon is good too. So there's more enough resources out there if you want to go deeper on this topic. It's up to you. But um, anyways, so I think most of us probably adhere to these points. Oops, sorry that we believe the new testament documents are historically reliable evidence and of course the historical evidence in the new testament talks about jesus being god incarnate and therefore we believe that the historical evidence is that jesus is god incarnate sorry i keep having problems with this slide but i think most christians that sit in churches every week probably accept these premises premises both premise one and two uh, maybe not thought through why they believe that, but it's certainly uh, something that a lot of Christians already accept, um, no doubt about it. Now, there's no doubt that the events in the New Testament belong in the past. The, the life of Jesus is in the past. We weren't there to observe it. It can't be relived or observed directly. No one was there to see it. And just like all kinds of events in history in the past, 
and science as well. Some events we weren't there to see in science as well, of course. But the data we get, then we get the data, such as the reports, the manu- the uh, documents, the witnesses, the artifacts, and the circumstantial data is what has survived. Um, we don't have direct access there because we weren't there. So we have to go by what history gives us, which are reports, documents, witnesses talking about what happened, archaeological evidence, things like that. So no doubt that pertains to the New Testament. So no historian, nobody was there to participate in the events, right? Any historian that's trying to figure out things about Jesus, they weren't there. So they rely, as I said, they rely on the written documents, as I say, number one here. They rely on the testimony of the witnesses. They rely on looking, they ask questions like, you know, what caused the birth of the Jesus movement? What got this thing going? They'll ask that kind of question. It's called historical causation. <clears throat> and then they'll look for archae- archaeology or some sort of external data that will will actually show that the authors are writing about historical things. I'll show you some of the archaeology of the New Testament as we move forward here. So these are just some of the tools they use. You know, when a store an historian is trying to figure out a historian is trying to figure out what we can know about Jesus, right? They weren't there to see it. They weren't there to participate in it. So these are things they have to rely on, okay? Now, if somebody does not uh, hold to a belief in miracles, of course, if they don't think God exists, then they're going to have a hard time believing in miracles, right? Because if God exists, miracles happen. But the New Testament's filled with miracles. The life of Jesus has all kinds of miracles, and... If your worldview is that you're what we call naturalist or materialist, meaning that you believe the natural world is all there is, the material world is all there is, then you're not going to believe in a large majority of the New Testament, right? Because there's a lot of miracles there. There's people rising from the dead and virgin births and and people coming back to life and people being healed and other things. So it's going to be really hard to take the New Testament seriously if you don't believe in miracles, right? I mean, you could just read it as like a fiction book if you think it's like fiction because you don't believe in the miracles parts, right? Or the parts about miracles. So we are theists and being our worldview is theism, we believe God exists and we believe miracles are both possible and actual. So that's a worldview issue, right? Worldview, I've talked to people over the years that, yeah, they say, I really like Jesus. I think he's a great teacher, a great ethical teacher. I love his sayings, but I just don't accept some of that stuff in the New Testament. I'll say, like what? Well, you know, I don't know about him walking on water and feeding the 5,000 and rising from the dead and, you know, virgin birth, things like that. Like, I can't accept that stuff. That stuff's too weird for me so or just too unbelievable, right? So they... um You know, sometimes they just don't... You know, there's a lot of the New Testament, they just don't believe it because of their worldview right? And uh, that's really significant because if if you strip Jesus of his supernatural, of the supernatural aspect of Jesus, and all you have is just an ordinary Jesus, right? He's just a guy that taught some really good moral things, and he's an example to follow, like a moral example, and that's it. But of course, we believe Jesus is much more than that. So that's really, like I said, it goes back to being, it's a worldview issue that you have to deal with with people. We've done another talk on worldviews. Now, there's no doubt in the past that uh, they didn't have access. I think you probably know this, like, gee, Eric, I didn't know this. But they did not have access to video cameras, internet, texting and phone, television. You know, they couldn't just take their phone when Jesus was walking on water and just take a picture of them or text it to their friends and didn't have social media and all the things we have today. It's a totally different day. And so some people have a hard time. You think that sounds so basic, but so many people act like they should have just videotaped Jesus right and left. I mean, if he really did all these things, wasn't the way they could videotape it? No, there wasn't. So um, we have to rely upon the written documents, right? So anyways, um, just, you know, I think we all know this, right? And like I said, if you want direct evidence, that's not going to be attainable because that's something that you were there to observe directly. And we weren't there to directly observe Jesus, um, but that's okay. 
because, you know, if you look at all historical evidence in the past and even cold case investigations where the detective gets called in to look at the murder victim, which he didn't see was murder, right? He never saw it with his own eyes. He has to compile a case and then present it to court of law. And it's, it's going to be based on circumstantial evidence, it's not direct evidence, right? Kind of like the same thing with science, because you think about it, nobody was there to see the beginning of the universe or how life began. No one was there to see how planet Earth got with all the right things in, or how planet Earth got set up precisely for life. Nobody was there to see any of that, but we uh, we tend to come up with our best explanations for why it is the way it is, but nobody saw it happen, right? So Jesus, the case for Jesus is really built more in circumstantial evidence than direct evidence, but that's okay. Um, you know, and sometimes when historians, when they're studying the New Testament, you know, they're, they're trying to actually, believe it or not, treat it as like they do with other ancient documents from antiquity. Um, there wasn't really like a New Testament they had put together yet, right? They're just, they're a collection of independent documents. And so historians can evaluate the New Testament just like they do with other history books. Um, no reason why they shouldn't be able to do that. And they do do that. Now, one thing that historians definitely want are they want the earliest sources they can find. Like David Hackett Fisher said here in his great book that came out a long time ago called Historians' Fallacies Towards the Logic of, Historial, Logic of Historical Thought. He says, the story must not merely provide good relevant evidence, but the best relevant evidence and the best relevant evidence of all things in equal is evidence which is most nearly immediate to the event itself and why do they want the sources that are closest to the uh the earliest sources because the further you get away obviously as decades and decades go on and centuries go on the more chance that that, that story is going to be embellished right um it's just the way history works the further you get away from the actual event that's going to happen that's right when you read Books like the Gnostic Gospels or the, 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 you know, those things were all written in the second century. The further you get away from the first century, you find really weird things written about Jesus um, when you read some of those books. So uh, you can just read them. You can tell. You read the Gospel of Thomas, it's really weird. Um, or the Gospel of Peter. Those are all written way, 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 way further than the New Testament. So, and you can tell when you read it. So... Now, the earliest source we have for Jesus is Paul. Um, it is not the Gospels themselves. Paul, of course, was originally antagonist of Jesus, and then he came to faith in Jesus, and he wrote the majority of the New Testament. He has 13 letters, right? And all these documents were written somewhere between probably 48 and 68 AD, but Paul received all that information even before that, before he even wrote it down. He received it prior to 50, to 60, to 70. He probably received it back here in 30, uh, 35 to 45 AD, right in that range right there. Um, but he wrote it down, of course, at some point. But all this information about Jesus was circulating already right back in here at the very beginning after Jesus was crucified. I'll show you another chart in a minute. So... As I said, Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. His, some of his letters are short, as you know, some are longer. And then, of course, you have other non-Pauline epistles. You have these other books that talk about Jesus, too. Uh, Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. But one of the earliest uh, document, or one of the earliest sources we have for Jesus about his death and resurrection is 1st Corinthians 15. And when Paul passes on this information here, uh, this is information that he received prior to writing it, because he says right here, what I received, I pass on to you as first importance, that the Messiah died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now, notice he says he received this information. He says, what I received, I passed on to you. So that means... He received this from someone else. Orally, someone passed it on to him, most likely. Um, because if you read there as a 1 Corinthians 15, that, that text there, he talks about all the resurrection appearances. And he mentions Peter by the name of Cephas. He mentions all the other appearances there. 
And he most likely got this from Peter when he went to Galatia. Some of this information, he went to Galatia to visit Peter. If you read Galatians chapter 1, he went and spent time with Peter. But what you see is that uh, Paul received this information, even though he wrote 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians uh, around 50 to 55 AD, he received that information even prior to that, back in here somewhere, 30 to 40 in that range. But that's a very early source for the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, all Paul's letters are early. And of course, there's other information he has about Jesus in those letters. But he talks about things, historical details of Jesus's life in his letters, right? Even though they're not biographies, they're letters written to communities. He talks about the Jewish ancestry of Jesus. He talks about Jesus being of the line of David, being born of a woman, being born in a Jewish law, that Jesus has brothers, he has disciples. Um, he talks about Jesus' humility, his poverty, his meekness, his gentleness, some of his teachings. Um, so Paul does mention some historical things about Jesus, and they line up with Jesus. What Jesus teaches, Paul teaches. They're not opposed to one another sometimes people say i noticed that with muslims and other groups they try to pit jesus against paul so there is evidence for jesus being a real historical figure and some of the light the the things jesus did are talked about in paul's letters okay <clears throat> now uh also what we want to realize is what's called um oral tradition or oral memory and that means that before everything was written down, of course, it was passed on orally because that's the way it works. I mean, you, you say something orally before it's written down. That's the way most everything is, almost everything is communicated, right? Um, and Jesus taught orally. He, um, he was an oral teacher. And so, you know, you think of these two definitions Oral tradition is that which is passed down from one generation to another, persists over a number of generations. And then oral history, a reminiscence is what you get when you ask eyewitnesses or those whom they have informed within living memory for their recollections. That, that's what happens in most cases and everything, such as the Holocaust, when the witnesses are passing on the information, right, of what happened to them there. We'll talk more about that. But Jesus is seen as a rabbi and a teacher, as we know, in the Gospels, and he passed things on orally. Um, he explained the Torah a lot. He, he quoted a lot of things from the Old Testament. And he was an oral teacher, as I said. That's what they did in that culture. Now, in order for something to be passed on correctly over time, you've got to have somebody that's able to transmit that tradition and is able to keep some checks and balances on it and then other thing the other thing that keeps it makes it reliable is the uh the techniques that the teacher is using to maintain those traditions and make them to be able to be passed on orally there's got to be techniques that he's using to make them to be can be so you can even be remembered right um these Mn mnemonic you know these uh these techniques that are used as jesus did i mean he you know as i say here since over 90 percent of jesus's teaching was poetic he would make it simple to memorize so now it's no doubt the jews at that time there was disciples and they had rabbis and the rabbis would train their disciples and the disciples eventually supposed to emulate the rabbi and the rabbi would pass on things and they were memorized a lot of the Old Testament. They can memorize huge portions of the Old Testament, more so than we can do today, obviously. But Jesus, in many cases, you read the Gospels, there's many times where he keeps telling them, reminding them, he who has ears, let him hear. He talks about, you know, he uses the things about um, communicating the importance of hearing and obeying. Hear, hear, hear what I'm saying, obey. Um, so there's no reason why Jesus couldn't pass this stuff on correctly and they had you know it's not like a game of telephone where you go around a circle one person says something at the end it gets all garbled that's not the way oral tradition works at the time of jesus okay that's contrary to what westernized assumptions are uh, but jesus for one thing you're trying to pass on the story of jesus accurately so unless jesus is not considered to be that important 
Uh, I could see why it wouldn't be handled well, but you know, Jesus is the Lord, and I think his disciples probably wanted to get the story right. I don't think that they have any motive to kind of make it all garbled and, oh, we just can't figure out what Jesus said, kind of a sloppy attitude towards it. They they probably had checks and balances in place to check some of those those things, and, and if it got off track, someone would correct it, okay? Of course, they had the Holy Spirit, too, as I know. Because Jesus said he passed on the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would call to their minds what Jesus taught. So I know there's a supernatural element as well. But Jews would be educated in the synagogue, the home, and the elementary school, and they were taught to recount large qualities, quantities of material that was even greater than the gospel themselves. Like I said, they learned to memorize a lot of the Old Testament. Um, wasn't as hard as it was for us today, probably. It was a lot easier then, but they did do it. Okay, so just remember, before you even get to the Gospels, like when you're talking about the day in the Gospels, remember everything was oral first, okay? So it was being passed on before it was even written, right? So a lot of times people focus on when it's actually written, but you need to remember that that's after it was orally being transmitted, right? And remember, Paul is earlier than all these Gospels right here, right? He's the earliest source we have. And you know, the conservative dates of the Gospels are here on this chart. That means conservative scholars that like believe Jesus really is a son of God and he died and rose from the dead. They're not liberal scholars or skeptical scholars. Um, that would be their dating mostly for the Gospels. The Matthew is dated between 60 and 80. That marks the late 50s to late 60s. The Luke, it's early 60 to 80s. And John's the mid 60s to 100. He could be 80 to 90. Just depends. And then the liberal datings, the other ones down the bottom. Um, but uh, one thing I want to mention is that um, there's a really good book that came out, which I just got. Actually, this book just came out this year. Um, there's a big, there's a new move by this author to talk about the Gospels are written way earlier than it was commonly assumed. Um, he thinks they're way earlier than some of these dates I have on that slide previously. But even if, it do, even if they were earlier, it really doesn't matter because, um, well, I, I'll get back to that with memory. Just I'll go back to the dating when I talk about memory. Uh, but what are the Gospels? What kind of literature are they? What's the genre? What type of literature are they? Um, well, they're definitely not modern biographies. They're ancient historical biographies. And you don't want to try to put a modern biographical expectation on them right because they kind of wrote a little more generally they like luke says jesus was about 30 he doesn't say jesus was definitely 30 he just says luke was he's a little more looser there um and they don't recall in, in an ancient biography they do not spend a lot of time trying to recall all the details of the person's life um, they only include in the biography what they think is important that's why you notice there's not a lot of emphasis on Jesus's childhood. And that's the, that's just because it's a kind of the type of literature it is. They don't talk about the childhood of the person. It's really not that important. They focus on the most important aspects of their life. In the case of Jesus, it's mostly his miracles, his death and resurrection. Right. Um, so, you know, just remember that they're, they're ancient biographies, but ancient doesn't mean unreliable, but they're not modern biographies. Um, when this guy wrote his entire dissertation on what the, the kind of literature the Gospels are, he he broke it down when he said, Richard Burge, he said, an ancient biography can be broken into three main parts, the birth, public life, and death of the person, with the bulk of the book being devoted to the subject's public career. And that's what you kind of see in the life of Jesus, right? That's the kind of literature it is, the kind of biography it is. Now, the Gospels are also a unique form of testimony um, because we are trusting the testimony of the witnesses that talk about Jesus and they, they're the ones that told their, told the road about him and, you know, wrote to their communities. But, you know, that's part of the bulk of history is always going to be based on testimony. Do we have reliable witnesses that can pass on what they remember to us, right? Because we weren't there. And, uh, and that's what uh, Richard Bauckham wrote about in this, his um, book here, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, the Gospels as Eyewitness Testimony. He does a whole 
store a whole chapter on how testimony works and how he gives stories of people giving testimony about things that happen. Um, so it's kind of interesting, but uh, definitely the Gospels are a form of testimony, no doubt about it. And as I said, as Michael Bird says here, you know, the Gospels are rooted in the memories of the earliest eyewitnesses. And so we have to believe, you know, this is really, you know, memory is a huge role, obviously, because, you know, as Richard Bauckham showed in his book, that unique events that are unexpected can generally be remembered for long periods of time, long, long periods of time, um, and, and high impact events as well, as I'll talk about in a minute. Um, events that are personally important, relevant, tend to long term memory, as I just said, in a, long, a high impact event. Events in which one's emotionally involved or memorable or being a participant and you were there like you participated, obviously, that makes a big difference. Um, in some, you know, we see that these memory, the, the gospel authors, there's a lot of vivid imagery there as well that are remembered. Um, some people are skeptical of memory. Uh, you know, they, they think, well, you know, that was long, if it's long, long written way after, how do we like the gospels, if it's written... 20, 30 years or more after the time of Jesus, how are we supposed to trust their memory? Can they really remember accurately what Jesus did? I mean, can they do it? Well, of course they can do it because if you think about high impact events in your life or just in history, those things are remembered decades later because most of you now remember, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but I remember where I was on 9-11. I remember the exact day. Why? Because that was a high impact event. Right. It wasn't like just going to get ice cream at Dairy Queen. That was a huge event in our lives. Remember that day. Or if you talk to World War II survivors or military victims that are in wars, they can remember what happened there several decades later because that was a high impact event. Um, the, the Holocaust survivors, obviously, they can they were test We had testimony of Holocaust survivors four or five, six decades later. Right because they were there, they participated in it, right? That was a high impact event. And that's very similar to what happened with Jesus and his followers, okay? Do you think Jesus had any kind of impact on them? Do you think they could remember it? I think they could, and I think they could uh, remember it um, later on or much later on, even though they probably, like I said, they were passing on orally to begin with, but they could certainly remember it accurately three decades, four decades later or more. Um, it's not that hard to do when you have an uh, the person like Jesus who's making the impact, right? Now, somebody might say, well, you know, why isn't there more written about Jesus? Well, I mean, Jesus did all this stuff. He's supposed to be this amazing figure in history. He changed world history. His life itself had such an impact. Why wouldn't we have more written about him? And... You know, it's kind of like, uh, I, I appreciate what John Walton and Craig Keener say here. They say, writing material was expensive. For example, a copy of the Gospel of Mark may have required the equivalent early 21st century buying power of 1000 to 2000 US dollars. Works as large as these were major literary undertakings requiring so much papyrus. In terms of the early 21st century buying power, the larger Gospels may have been worth thousands of dollars of US dollars. Normally, antiquity readers knew who produced such major works whether whether by information on the outside of the scroll or by knowledge circulated only by word of mouth in a work this size speaking of the gospels authorship would be the one of the last details forgotten we'll talk about that in more but the point is that it wasn't that easy just to write something down it's not like they could just go down to drug or uh, the local drugstore and get a thing a, a pad you know and just write on okay it wasn't Things were a little different then, right? Now, this guy wrote a book um, called Divinity of Doubt, and he puts up an objection to the Gospels. He says that the, he gives an example of the, the uh, Charles Manson case, where he says that uh, the Charles Manson case is hearsay. Um, I'm sorry, the uh, the Gospels, he says, are hearsay because, uh, you know, we don't, we can't talk to the living eyewitnesses right now. We can't interview the witnesses of uh, that wrote about the Gospels. Uh, no, duh, because it was like 2,000 years ago. But 
he says basically the witness can't be cross-examined by the defense and the statement's not going to be admitted in the court um and the witnesses the gospels of course they can't be cross-examined they've been dead for many centuries so we can't trust them it's the most ridiculous objection ever one of them um because if i apply that criteria to him then in another hundred years we wouldn't be able to we wouldn't have any living witnesses about him and no one could testify about his career and what he wrote it can't be questioned right uh maybe someone comes along and says well vincent bugliosi buglosi Bug, i'm sorry bugliosi was lying maybe they say he was lying well can we talk to some witnesses about that well they're all dead well I guess we can't talk to them. So therefore, I mean, you know, let's just um, blow the whole thing off. So the point is that it doesn't matter if you can't interview the gospel authors right now. That's so ridiculous. It's an unattainable goal. And most of the, everything in antiquity, you can't interview any of the witnesses, right? They're all dead in, in antiquity about everything. So if, they're, if he's going to apply that to the gospels, then you, you would know a lot of things in history because a lot of the witnesses are dead, right? So it's kind of a ridiculous um, criteria that he wants. It's, it's kind of silly. Now, you talk about history, there's two kinds of sources, what we call a primary source and a secondary source. A primary source is the testimony of a direct eyewitness. That means somebody that was there, a contemporary of the events they're talking about, right? And then the secondary source is the testimony of anyone who is not a direct eyewitness, but the secondary source would get their information from the primary sources, okay? They would get their information from the direct eyewitnesses. Like they were in the, they weren't an actual direct eyewitness to Jesus, but they still can talk to the witnesses that were direct eyewitnesses, okay? Um, happens all the time. So for example, um, oh, when we say we're talking about eyewitnesses, remember that that I the word eyewitness comes from the word autopsy and there's what we call very similar to what I was just talking about on primary and secondary sources a direct autopsy that means that the historian was there to participate in the events like he was an actual participant in the in the events of Jesus right he was there he participated in the whole thing an indirect autopsy is just somebody they could have been, they were there, but they didn't really, um, weren't an actual participant with Jesus. Like they didn't see him do the things he did. They weren't, they, but they were still alive at the time, but they just, they didn't see any of that stuff. Okay. So they go get their information from a direct eyewitness. Let me show this, how this works. So Luke, Luke writes here, he says, since many have undertaken to compile a narrative, the events have been fulfilled among us, just as those were eyewitnesses from the beginning, ministers of the word have handed down, them down to us. I too have decided after investigating everything carefully, I knew to write it down orderly sequence, you must excellent Theophilus, that you may realize the certainty of the teachings you have received. So notice he says, I decided to investigate everything carefully to write it down orderly sequence. He says, I've compiled a narrative um of the events just as those are eyewitnesses beginning ministers of the word they've been handed down to him they, they he's receiving this information from the eyewitnesses right he was not a direct eyewitness of the events of jesus he was not an eyewitness participant but he researched into those that were the direct eyewitnesses right and so that's where he gets his information from nothing wrong with that as i'll talk more about in a minute luke gets so many things right historically as i'll talk about in a minute John uh, was probably a direct eyewitness of Jesus, as the uh, Gospel of John talks about. The author of John was certainly acquainted with a lot of Jewish things, like the, you read about the feasts in John, the Feast of Tabernacles, dedica Feast of Dedication, John 10. He's very acquainted with Jewish customs. Um, the Gospel of John indicates the author was an apostle, one of the 12 disciples, and John the son of Zebedee who's associated as the beloved disciple accompanies Peter. Um, but then when it comes to Mark, Mark probably uh, was not a direct eyewitness. He probably got all his, a majority of his information from Peter. If you look at Peter's gospel or um, Mark's gospel, it becomes be kind of obvious that he's getting some of his, inform or some of his information from Peter at least, because Peter was a direct eyewitness, right? Because Mark named Simon with reference to Peter seven times and Peter 19 times. And a lot of the early um, 
church fathers, not that I agree with all they said, by the way, the early church apologists, um, they ascribed Mark to Peter's teachings, uh, that Mark used Peter, a lot of Peter's, um, Peter is his eyewitness, okay? So that's very common knowledge, okay? Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, some people might say that, you know, that we don't have the names of the gospel authors on each gospel. Like if you read Matthew, it doesn't have his name on it saying, I, Matthew, wrote this. Or John says, I, John, wrote this. Or Mark says, I, Mark, wrote this. And Luke says, I wrote, I, Luke, wrote this because it, it, you know, it, it's it's kind of a silly argument, but they they seem to think that maybe the, the Gospels are written anonymously, okay? And, you know, it's kind of ridiculous to have that assumption that they should put their name on them, um, because what part, one of the problem is the earliest manuscripts we have, um, we don't have any copies of uh, what we call anonymous gospel anonymous copies of matthew mark luke or john um that uh you know we don't have any what i mean by that is that all the the uh the uh the manuscripts we have are right here as i have on the slide right here and they come second third fourth fifth century and on and they 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 subscribe basically they they talk about how these things are written by matthew mark luke or john like they that's all we have so we don't have any information of any manuscripts that don't where they're not attributed to matthew mark luke and john there's nothing out there that would indicate they're not attributed to matthew mark luke and john um so you know to say that the gospels originally had no titles like no names on them just doesn't make any sense really because the earliest manuscripts we have have their names on them right okay i mean have like they're they're, they're they had no you know they're the earliest titles the earliest manuscripts we have have they're ascribed to matthew mark luke and john um also remember that when plutarch who is a contemporary of jesus he was a biographer he wrote about 60 biographies you know that his name is absent there's not on any of those biographies um, but most skeptics don't really nobody really questions that plutarch wrote them right just because his name is absent from the biography so it's a very interesting criteria people have now one thing that uh or one thing historians also do they want to know if the authors told the truth obviously they want to know if the witnesses were able to tell the truth and did they tell the truth obviously that's really important because they can write about anything the question is are they telling the truth and some people might say well you know the new testament is written by the insiders those people that were biased you know they love jesus and they all they want to do is protect jesus the reputation of jesus and they're all biased and so that basically means they assume that the new testament authors were not honest or they fabricated something and so what you want to say to someone when they say that is that you know being biased doesn't mean that you cannot tell the truth um sometimes when you're biased and you're passionate about truth you're more inclined to get the story right and you know if anyone is lying in the new testament you've got to have you got to ask the person to show them where they are lying or fabricating so they make them show it to you if that's the assertion they're making right put it back on them and say where do you see them lying can you please show me where where do they fabricate something the New Testament contains a ton of what we call embarrassing details about Jesus and the disciples. That if you're writing something about yourself or writing something about Jesus, and you want to try to get people to believe this. You're writing the Gospels because you want people to start following Jesus and be committed to him. You, there's some things that be counterproductive. They don't put you in a positive light or put Jesus in a positive light. They wouldn't be convincing to a first century audience if if you're some of the gospel author, I mean, the gospel authors have the testimony of women. They have women finding Jesus's tomb. Um, a woman's testimony is not really, for mostly not reliable. Women are not looked down upon a little more in that culture, and their testimony is not necessarily trusted. So it'd be weird that they would make up a bunch of women finding the tomb, right? That would be counterproductive. Um, there's also just writing about Jesus being crucified 
is very embarrassing because most Jews thought a crucified Messiah was very embarrassing. They didn't think it was a badge of honor. So, you know, if you want to make up a Messiah to convince people or to convince that Jesus is a Messiah, the last thing you want to do is make up a crucifixion story. Um, that would make any, that would not get Jews to believe. And a lot of times the disciples are an embarrassing, are made to look embarrassed. You know, they, I mean, it's embarrassing things about the disciples, like Peter denies Jesus, as we know, they fall asleep on Jesus. You know, if you're writing the gospels, I mean, that's something you probably would want to leave out. I mean, if it's, they're going to be mentioning your name, you know, Peter would probably be like, please don't put that in there about me. I failed my Messiah. That's embarrassing to me, right? They're slow to believe. The disciples, in many cases, are slow to believe in Jesus. You know that they struggle with faith. They're not presented always in a positive light. So there's a lot of embarrassing details about the disciples throughout the Gospels. Um, you know, Jesus is also... Um, you know, some places in the Gospels, Jesus has looked, it's embarrassing about Jesus as well. Um, you know, he, of course, he calls his disciples dim-witted. That's not really a compliment to you as a disciple, right? So there's a lot of embarrassing details, which means that they most likely told the truth. Why would they put those things in there? Of course, there's a ton of historical markers. There's a ton of historical figures, real people that are mentioned in uh, the Gospels and in the book of Acts as well. These are real people that have been, you know, we've shown in archaeology, these are not like fake fictitious people, right? So that's been, for a while, that's been pretty established. Um, there is, uh, you know, look what Luke just like says right here. Does it look like Luke is making something up? I mean, look at the details about these specific people are actually known from history. You can tell Luke is writing history, right? Um, look at his attention to detail. And the book of Acts, there's a guy named Colin Hemmer. He wrote a book called The Book of Acts and Hellenistic History. He talked about there are 84 historically confirmed details in Acts that are, re record, you know, we've recorded in archaeology. They found real people, real places that are recorded in the book of Acts. Um, he looks right here. You've got <clears throat> Luke gets a lot of these things right as far as um, the um, all these things mentioned in Acts are real places, real names they found, um, real titles. Um, so, you know, Luke is definitely recording history, okay? Um, John does the same thing in the book of John. There's been about 59 historically confirmed, historically eyewitness details of John, things they have found to confirm the book of John. Uh, a lot of, he seems to have a lot of knowledge of the culture and the geography of Israel at the time. They have found the, some of the archaeological finds, they have found the Pilate inscription. That is the, yes, that's the Pilate who ordered Jesus' crucifixion. That's his name right there on it. They found that in about 1961. They also have found a crucifixion victim that would, this is the exact same way that Jesus would have been crucified, the Yohanan cru crucifixion. Um, they found a bone box, what's called an ossuary. That's where someone was buried in these bone boxes in Israel. And they found a male crucifixion victim, and this was his name, Yohanan ben Hagkol. Hagol, Hagkol, I'm sorry. And you can see the way the, um, the nails going through his wrist and in his heel. That's the way a crucifixion would happen. That's the way Jesus would have been crucified. Once again, I'm saying, I'm not saying this is Jesus's bones, obviously, but this is the way someone would have been crucified, and that's the way Jesus would have been crucified. There's a whole bunch of them they found that were crucified, because Romans love crucifying people. So anyway, pretty gross, I know, but that's the way someone was really crucified. And, oop, I already talked about this. Let me see. Um, yeah, anyway. Then they found the Caiaphas bone box because what would happen is that you all for a family ossuary they would bury all the family together like all your bones go in these ossuaries. 
these bone boxes and they would they found a bunch of these in Israel in the early 1990s and one of these uh, reads Caiaphas um, on the side and they think that is the same Caiaphas that ordered Jesus's um, he charged Jesus with blasphemy in the trial scene in Mark chapter 14 when he rips his robe and you know the high priest you know Jesus says I'm going to come in the clouds as the son of man and he gets accused of blasphemy that is the same Caiaphas so they think they found the Caiaphas ossuary they found, uh, of course, this, you can go to see this if you go to Israel. This is the place of the skull, Golgotha. The, play, the site of Jesus' crucifixion, located near the garden tomb outside the Damascus Gate. Um, <clears throat> and they also have found this inscription. Um, this, this guy was one of Paul's first converts. Um, he's mentioned the book of Acts. So, Sigerius Paulos. Paulos? Um, anyway. Luke mentions 32 countries, 54 cities, 9 islands, and 12 confirmed ruling figures without air. Um, so, he definitely is a, a first rank historian. They also found this. This is mentioned in the Gospel of John. I think you guys know about this in John chapter 5. Um, that confirmed an a part of the archaeology in the book of John. Let's see, they've also found a Galilean boat. In 1986, they found this 2,000-year-old boat in the sediment of the Sea of Galilee. It was so delicate and so um you, you can't really move it because it'll fall apart i don't know how they, i forget how they moved it but they had to use a bunch of chemicals to raise and support the boat into this museum but it fits a description of a the kind of boat that would have been around the time of jesus that is that old a boat in the sea of galilee um 26 feet long seven feet wide that's kind of interesting amazing that's still preserved isn't it Fascinating, really. <clears throat> this is a rock cut tomb. This is the kind of tomb Jesus would have been buried in. He was buried in, of course, Joseph Arimathea, who was rich, could afford a rock cut tomb because Jesus was poor. And that's why Jesus, or Joseph Arimathea, came to Pilate and asked for a proper burial for Jesus. He knew that he could put Jesus in a family, his family tomb, which is a rock cut tomb, which cost some money, which exactly would look much like this. That was what a rock cut tomb would look like. So that's probably similar the kind of tomb Jesus would have been buried in. Okay, with a giant rock over it, of course, to cover it, but um, that's what we call rock cut tomb. Uh, the gospel authors reference all kinds of towns. They're real towns, right? They're not fictional towns. These are real towns. He, they reference a lot of regions, different regions. Um, real regions they reference bodies of water other geographical things all in all um the gospel authors have a large amount of geographical references they they list 40 let's see matthew lists 43 towns mark lists 33 luke lists 62 john lists 39 Matthew has 32 regions, Mark has 16, Luke has 29, John has 25. Um, you can look at the bodies of water and other places. So obviously they're writing about real places, real, real things, right? Okay. Um, now, it's something called the biographical test. And that deals with the manuscripts of the New Testament, where we look to see about how far the manuscripts away from the actual event, um, the time of Jesus, the first manuscripts we have. And if you look at this chart here, obviously there are more manuscripts, earlier manuscripts, and more manuscripts in the New Testament than any of these other writings. Um, 
And what that means is that that gives scholars more manuscripts to look at, more they can compare to each other, and see if they all tell the same story, see if they're accurate versus less manuscripts. Um, but of course, they're written in a, there's a shorter amount of gap in years as well in the, in the, uh, the time span compared to these other writings as well. So we certainly have way, way, way more manuscripts for the New Testament, which helps scholars try to, you know, make, helps them in their work. Now, sometimes when they find a manuscript, there may be a letter missing or a word missing, um, you know, due to a scribal error or something. But you can still make out the meaning of the sentence, even if some things are missing. Like, think if you found a sentence that said God is just and the justifier, the one who has faith in Jesus, and copy one was written like this, copy two was written like this, copy three, copy four, copy five. The original was perfect, but then you're missing certain lettering and things. I think you could probably still make out the meaning, right? So it's not going to hurt anything. Those are good books on that topic, by the way. You know, some people say the Bible's just been translated so many times. I've heard that over the years. Um, that's pretty uninformed. Only There's only really about 40 lines uh, in 22,000 lines in the New Testament. Only 40 are contested. That's about 400 words. And none of them really affect any significant Christian doctrine. Um, as D.A. Carson says, who I agree with, he says that, you know, people say the Bible's been translated and recopied so many times is really quite uninformed. As D.A. Carson says, the purity of the text is so such a substantial nature, nothing we believe to be true, nothing you're commanded to do is anyway jeopardized by variant readings. So he's saying that even if you have other manuscripts that um, may be debated, like there may be debate between one manuscript and the other, it's nothing in anything being debated doesn't affect any substantial doctrine. It's nothing of major consequence. Um, so, anyways, now when it comes to Jesus outside the New Testament, yeah, there are sources to talk about Jesus. All these sources here um, do say something about Jesus. There are things in Josephus' writings in the Arabic version, the, um, the one that's most reliable. He talks about Jesus being crucified, talks about the brother of Jesus, James. He mentions Pilate. Um, some of these other writings, Tacitus mentions the early Christians uh, having an uprising of some kind, that the movement is growing and it's creating an up a problem. He mentions them, they're creating a problem, these early believers. And some of these other writings mention something about Jesus or his followers. Um, they're not all, they're not as good re as good a resources as the New Testament, no doubt. They're, they're just extra, something you can use, but you know, there's not going to be, they're not never going to be as good as the New Testament, okay? Um, so just remember that. You can read more about these, a uh, summary, uh, as F.F.'s Bruce, F.F. F. F. Bruce wrote in his book, Jesus and Christian Origins Outside the New Testament. You know, he summed it up, what we can know about Jesus outside the New Testament. These were the following things, 1 through 12, that what you could at least get an outline of Jesus' life. Um so you can find some things about Jesus, find out about some things about Jesus outside the New Testament, but it's not, to say it's not near as good as the New Testament itself. Uh, you can read more about Jesus outside the New Testament in Robert Van Voorst's book here, Jesus Outside the New Testament. It's a good resource. So, um, don't really have a ton else to add, but uh, that's some history behind the life of Jesus. Certainly there's much more we could say, but Jesus is certainly a figure of history, and history and faith matter quite a bit. So having said that, I think I'll go ahead and stop. And